Our next speaker is Dr. David René. Uh, David is currently in his second term as the president of the International Solar Energy Society. He recently retired from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in the United States, where since 1991, he developed and managed programs on renewable energy resource assessment and analysis, and the integration of resource data into a geographic information system. He continues to serve as the operating agent of an international energy agency solar heating and cooling program entitled Solar Resource Assessment and Forecasting, and is an associate editor of the Solar Energy Journal. He is now an international renewable energy consultant working under the trade name Dave René Renewables and serves as a senior consultant to Clean Power Research, a private company in the US that produces and disseminates solar resource assessment products for industry and government planners. Please welcome Dr. David René. Good morning, and thank you for your kind introduction and for your invitation to this excellent forum. So I'm going to talk about solar resource assessment and forecasting. This is a task that's been uh, going on now for over 10 years under the Solar Heating and Cooling Program. It's uh, currently Task 46 with that title. Started off as Task 36 with the title of Solar Resource Knowledge Management. And this, the purpose of this task is to provide the solar ener energy industry and electricity sector as well as governments and planners and end users with data that is it's possible to understand whether the data are bankable or not. Now, I know the term bankability gets used a lot, not always correctly. In this particular case, what I'm referring to is providing data sets that have known information about the, the uncertainty of the data and its, and its uh, quality and its value so that decision makers, either in, in deploying or in operating systems, can uh, have some understanding of the quantitative risk of using the data. And the task has four major objectives. The first is to evaluate solar resource variability both in a time scale and spatial context, uh, to develop standardization and integration procedures for uh, pr producing bankable data sets. Um, we're, we spend a lot of time looking at solar resource forecasting capabilities because this is something that's very important now to the uh, power sector in, in deploying large scale solar electric systems in the, into the grid. And we also are continuing to look at ways to improve the methodologies, especially the models that are available for providing solar resource estimates using satellite-based uh, weather, weather satellite based observations. So what I'll do here is go through a few highlights from each of these four objectives. Uh, under the task of solar resource variability, uh, as I said, we've been looking both at the spatial as well as the temporal uh, variability. Uh, the top chart is um, the results that you get for very, if you average solar data over various time scales ranging from a few minutes out to the, the entire uh, year, the global average. Uh, you can see that the uh, variability is more and more predictable as time goes on because you can incorporate the seasons to uh, better understand how the solar resource might vary. Uh, what I want to draw your attention to is the bottom graph. Now, this is a very important concept that as you take data from a diverse geographic region, the variability uh, of the data set as a whole is much lower than the data from any individual station. And this is a very important concept for utility operations because the utilities are always concerned about how much intermittency and variability is going to uh, occur in their systems uh, due to the solar resource uh, changing from cloud conditions, et cetera. However, if you have a geographically dispersed array of solar panels or solar systems, the net variability of the entire system drops down. So the report that uh, is mentioned here will be available on the Task 46 website, and that provides uh, more detailed information about the results that have been uh, taken on this study. 
Under the area, uh, uh, the, the, the objective of data bankability, uh, we've had a number of different efforts going underway. One is on measurement best practices. Uh, measurements are always going to be important for solar radiation, for solar uh, in, um, technology applications, especially large-scale applications. Uh, there's been an effort underway to come up with more less expensive ways to uh, measure the solar resource, especially if you want the direct normal ins insulation. That's the irradiance that comes directly from the solar disk of the sun, and that's uh, the that's the energy that's primarily available for concentrating solar technologies. And that's typically been a very expensive parameter to measure because of very sophisticated equipment that's required to track the sun as it goes across the sky. Uh, over the last uh, couple of decades, there has been development of a uh, system called rotating shadow band radiometers or irradiometers. Uh, these are systems where you have one single measurement, but you have a, sh a, a shadow band that passes over that measurement device. And so when you have um, the measurement of the, the full sky and then you can compare that with the measurement of just a diffuse radiation where the sun is blocked out, you can also, by inference, calculate the direct normal irradiance. It's a much less expensive way to get the DNI measurement. However, it's also uh, uh, typically has had, had, had higher uncertainties and this study has been uh, focused on trying to better understand the characteristics of the rotating shadow band irradiometer, how f effective it can be used for, and how accurate the DNI calculations are coming out of that. Uh, as you can see, there's a manual that's been produced that's available on the Task 46 website under the Solar Heating and Cooling Program that, that documents and, and provides very good summary information about the, the value of these instruments and, and how they can be used for um, measurement programs. Another area is, is uh, just typically how we manage data that's been collected, either from measurements or from satellite-derived estimates. Uh, there's been a number of uh, workshops and studies that have been done to come up with consensus ways of uh, developing tools for uh, filling in missing data gaps or for flagging data that may have a questionable value and for just general um, quality control uh, uh, procedures. Uh, there's been a lot of work that's been done on this over many, many years. However, uh, a consensus set of standard ways of dealing with these uh, very important data uh, management issues has not really taken place. The, this task is beginning to f uh, develop consensus methodologies under this uh, for, for handling uh, data like this. Uh, the task will be continuing, and this work will continue as, as, we, as we go forward, but I think what's really important here is that we do have a group of international experts uh, that have min much experience in managing data sets and coming up with ways to fill data and to quality control data and to flag questionable data. And so these reports are coming out to start, start uh, forming a consensus uh, way of managing the data. Another task under this uh, overall objective of data bankability is uh, what we call data adaptation. Now we can go out and make measurements at a site and that's probably the most accurate way of getting data, but unfortunately you can't, you can't compress the time that it takes to make, make your measurements. So if you um, only have one year of data, you're maybe, which may be all the time you have before you want to make decisions on a project, you don't have enough information, say, for interannual variability. Um, so what this task has been doing is looking at ways to take short-term ground measurement data that's typically of higher quality than satellite-derived estimated data, but then merging that short-term data with the longer-term satellite data to come up with a, an adapted data set that's uh, got high quality and a longer-term time record. And this, uh, there's, there's a report that's been published on this that's, uh, that's available on your website on, on various methodologies for, um, a, for doing data adaptation. A very simple way is just to d take a ratio of the, uh, of the calculated time period and, or of, of averaging of, of the ratio of the measured time period with the calculations that occur for that same period and then extrapolating those ratios out to the entire data record. A little bit more sophisticated way is to look at two independent data sets and weight them 
based on their uncertainty, typically the measured data is going to have lower uncertainty than the estimated data. And there's methods for combining two data sets that way so that you can get a better estimate of the uncertainty of the data. Another way is to look at the cumulative distribution frequencies of data sets to see how they can be combined, uh, the short-term measured data with the longer-term uh, estimated data to com come up with an adapted data set. Um, benchmarking of satellite-derived uh, data has is, is been underway for uh, quite a few years in this task. This is where we look at various satellite-derived uh, data production methods for historic producing historical solar radiation estimates around the world. Um, there's been a very comprehensive study completed at the University of Geneva by Pierre Nishin that you can get uh, on site. It's, it's either all available from our website or from the University of Geneva's website. Basically what we're finding is that the satellite-based methods are getting quite good now. They, um, they can produce hourly uh, global horizontal irradiance estimates um, accurate to within 17 percent. In other words, if you look at all the possible errors, uh, both plus or minus from the actual, from an actual ground site, the, um, it's, it varies by as no more than 17 percent. And actually, if you take all the data and combine it together, there's really very little bias that shows up in the global horizontal estimates. Uh, that's very good news for uh, getting long-term data sets from satellite observations. Uh, we have a little bit more trouble with direct normal insulation. Uh, there's quite a bit more scatter in the uh, estimates, and also there is uh, sometimes there is bias that occurs in the estimates. Um, the standard deviation of the global horizontal radiance bias is quite low, uh, two to five percent. That's a, that's a plus or minus biases, but it's much higher for for direct normal irradiance. And the reason why the direct normal irradiance is typically more uncertain is because of the models. The clear sky model that's used in the satellite method always has a certain amount of uncertainty associated with it, and, it's, and the DNI is going to be most sensitive to that. But also, the, um, the getting good quality turbidity data, or data that documents the amount of haze and dust that's in the atmosphere, is often very difficult. It's, uh, there's, they are not, this information is not measured routinely, but yet it can be very important, especially in areas like here in the Middle East or in, in South Asia where there's a lot of uh, turbidity in the atmosphere either due to human uh, activities or due to dust blowing off of the uh, nearby deserts. So that's the, still the, the biggest source of uncertainty in, in, in uh, estimating DNI from these satellite-based methods. Another area that's been uh, very important, especially to the solar heating and cooling program, is looking at the typical meteorological year data sets. And I don't want to go into much detail here about this curve, but you can see that there's, there's, there's different ways to characterize the distribution of a, of, a, of a data set, and you get quite different results depending upon how you want to characterize that distribution. The problem with typical meteorological year data set, it provides a long-term hourly, uh, typical yearly record of hourly data. However, there's many different ways of producing these TMYs, and so different countries may have different results in their TMY data. So that's one area is that there's not a consistent standard for producing TMY data. Uh, there are some recommended practices that are going to be published in, in some of the final deliverables of this task, but the biggest problem is that the TMY data also does not give you the interannual variability. So you don't know to what extent your, your results are going to vary from year to year when you use TMY data. So uh, the recommendation that's coming out more and more now is to, is to do away with TMY data altogether and just use actual real-time data sets since uh, computer power is enough now to, to be able to ingest large amounts of uh, input data for system performance ev evaluation. Under the area of solar resource forecasting, we looked at uh, three different timelines. The first is what we call now casting, or uh, from right now to an hour ahead. Uh, uh, we, to do this kind of forecasting, typically we deploy uh, a device called an all-sky camera, which makes, uh, which looks at the sky and looks at the clouds coming across the sky, or or maybe having a nearby array of solar measurements so you can kind of get an idea of what's coming into a system, whether it's a cloud bank coming in that may cause a sudden ramp. Uh, to at a system. Uh, these these uh, measurements are usually deployed right next to or very close to a, a system 
uh, of solar si energy system. Uh, day ahead forecast is uh, pretty important for utility operations. Um, to get these types of forecasts, we look at something called cloud motion vectors derived from time-lapse imagery of satellite images. And um, oftentimes these are combined with numerical weather prediction models uh, to, to, to improve the output. Um, I'll show some examples of this in a minute. And then um, more, uh, also important to utility operations is longer term one to seven day ahead forecast so utilities can get a sense as to what uh, other systems they have to have on, online within their utility system, operating system in order to um, meet the expected lows over the next uh, several days. And here these types of forecasts are primarily derived from numerical weather prediction uh, models uh, or, op or a combination of model output statistics and, and also machine learning methods. So here's an example of the image you would get from an all-sky camera. Um, this is a study that's being done uh, near some uh, uh, concentrated solar power plants in Spain by uh, uh, Minas Paris Tech. And they have an array of ground-based uh, fisheye cameras that can give you uh, forecasts based on approaching clouds up to out to 15 minutes ahead. Uh, this is a program that's actually being done in collaboration with the Solar Paces uh, Implementing Agreement, IEA Implementing Agreement. Um, another study that's being done, this is at the University of Oldenburg, is looking at how accurately can we estimate solar radiation or so incoming solar radiation just from an, an all-sky camera image. And you can see here that they've developed some methods that the, the estimate of global horizontal irradiance at, at the ground is um, quite good uh, based on the, t the technologies they've produced from all sky image imagery. Um, this is what a cloud motion vector, this is conceptualized as a cloud motion vector. In other words, you take, you have, typically from a satellite, you have a uh, scan of the Earth's surface every 15 or maybe 30 minutes. And then what you can do with a with a um, cloud motion vector is interpolate between the 15 or the 30 minute images and produce one minute values of um, estimated cloud cover um, minute by minute uh, between that period of time. I'll just show that once again so you can kind of see it. I thought this re this loop, but apparently it doesn't. So that's basically the, the fundamental principle behind, behind cloud motion vectors. So benchmarking these forecasting methods, uh, there's been a couple of major studies done under this task. One has been looking at forecast methods in the United States as, uh, uh, based on various uh, good quality ground measurement data around the U.S. And you can see here that the, um, the European Center for Mid-Range mid uh, Weather Forecasting um, is t generally the, the highest the, the, the most accurate or the, or the least uncertain forecast that's available um, when you compare it against other forecast methods. The, the vertical scale on this is root mean square error, which is a measure of the uncertainty of the quality of the resource or the accuracy of the resource. It's, uh, it's just taking a statistical um, set of data, comparing the forecast with ground, ground observations at the time the forecast uh, applies for, and then looking at the root mean square error of that. And this is just an example of uh, different forecast methods uh, being compared against, um, the, uh, against the ground data. And as you can see, the, um, the, there's a number of forecast schemes here, but as I mentioned, the numerical weather prediction models coming out of the ECMWF or the, you know, the global forecast system from the United States are generally the most accurate. There are the, there's a green line there, I don't know how well you can see that, but that's uh, what we call smart persistence. That's basically just saying, well, let's, let's base our forecast for the next hour on, this for, on what is happening right now. And of course, persistence becomes uncertain quite quickly. The cloud motion vectors, you can see that's a that, uh, loop line there, also becomes uh, quite uncertain after about four, to four hours. So that's about the timeline that's most effective for cloud motion vectors. And these are some of the studies being done in Germany um, by the University of Oldenburg. And again, you, uh, what this chart is showing again is that various forecasting methods give you various amounts of uh, uh, expected error. Um, but more importantly, that if you do a forecast for a large area, the uncertainty goes down by quite a bit than, than at a single point. 
And then, of course, as you would expect, the uncertainty of the forecast gets higher and higher as you go out further and further in, into a timeline. And then under um, advanced resource modeling, I see my time is about up, so I'll, 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 I'll go through this quickly. The, uh, there's a consensus paper on what we really mean by direct normal irradiance. So there's, a, there's various standard definitions of direct normal irradiance, but as it turns out, concentrating solar power systems don't necessarily respond to, to all of the information that's contained in the direct normal irradiance, and there's a very important factor called circumsolar radiation, uh, where on a partially cloudy day or on a hazy day or day when there's high cirrus clouds, a lot of radiation is coming around a periphery around outside of the solar disk itself. That radiation is not necessarily measured by uh, ground measurements, but it's definitely impacting the performance of concentrating solar power systems. So there's a lot of work going on about how to improve the DNI definition and, and uh, the way we measure DNI so that it comes more closely matching what a CSP plant actually experiences. And then there's an, a work that's going on and looking at uh, various cloud parameters that can be derived from satellite data. So it's not just a yes, no decision, it's some information more about the probability of a cloud in a certain area, maybe even some characteristics about its uh, vertical extent based on infrared data coming out of the satellites. As I mentioned earlier, the um, turbidity information is really important and uh, the clear sky models um, do not perform well when you don't have good accurate uh, turbidity information. This is a global evaluation of clear sky models showing that the uncertainty is the highest in those yellow and orange areas um, and typically in areas where you expect dust to be uh, occurring in any case, such as in the Middle East and, and South Asia or where there's very little other data to confirm what the uh, turbidity really is. And then finally, we, we also are looking at long-term interannual variability. Some of that can be derived from uh, reanalysis data, which is a very uh, co comprehensive weather data set produced by various institutions around the world. But um, that doesn't really capture interannual variability adequately. And so there's a lot of work being done about how to better characterize interannual variability since that certainly affects the long-term cash performance of projects. And so having good knowledge of what that interannual variability is is quite important, especially on the DNI where interannual variability is much, seems to be much higher than it is for global horizontal irradiance. So to close, the, uh, this is project has been going on now for about uh, 12 years. It's had about 70 experts involved at one time or another. We have about 35 core experts representing 15 countries that have been working very hard on this task and has really have, has helped um, raise the level of information that would normally be available only through individual research programs. So it's really been an excellent collaboration. Out of this collaboration are coming consensus documents and best practice manuals. Uh, and which are either already in, in place or are in, the, in production now talking about uh, that to give more information about data variability and measurement best practices, data adaptation, quality control, those types of things. Uh, there's also, as I said, benchmarking studies for um, looking at the performance of models both historically as well as in forecasting mode. And um, the work uh, is wrapping up the task 46 under the solar heating cooling program is, is basically uh, wrapping up this year. The, the final report will come out uh, probably sometime this coming winter, uh, which will be an update to the best practices handbook that's gonna be produced by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, but it's a part of the task deliverable. But then there's been an effort underway to continue with this task it will probably move on under the auspices of the photovoltaic power systems because of the uh, important work that's being done in the forecasting area in particular, but the collaboration with solar heating and cooling and with um, solar paces will continue as this task goes forward. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention.